All right, so we're in Matthew chapter 3, and we made it through um, six verses of it last week, and we're talking about the, uh, uh, how in the first four chapters of Matthew, this is setting up who Jesus is, um, and then kind of, and also along with his identity, what his, what his mission is going to be. Um, and in particular, you, know, you see the, the kind of historical things, the genealogy, the visit of the Magi, um, the fulfillment of prophecy that Matthew points out in several places. And then now we get, uh, we move to John the Baptizer out in the wilderness, proclaiming, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, the kingdom of heaven, huge theme in there, and uh, that he is preparing the way for uh, the, the Lord who is to come, the Messiah who is to come. And we made it to verse 7 ish uh, last week, so we'll kind of pick up there. The, uh, well, we made it into, I guess, a little bit, yeah, into verse 7 itself. When John sees the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to be baptized by it, uh, coming to his baptism, uh, he calls out to them, you brood of vipers, which the significance of that was, it's literally translated offspring of snakes, which is, what's that? Satan? Yes, correct. Uh, you are, what we talked about last week, God is, yeah, uh, God is binary. You're either with him or you're against him. There's, there's no in between. And so, he is calling them to repentance, uh, uh, calling them calling them children of the devil in a real sense. And but the, the thing that he charges them with is he says, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And the the, the original Greek here uh, is the bear fruit that is worthy of repentance. So um, when we think about that. What is what does he first first of all what does he mean by that? Second of all, is that still true today for us? So. Bear fruit. I know it's true. Okay, it is true. It is true. What is what does that mean? Yes. And or keeping with repentance. Okay. It, it, that, that can be a fruit of it. Um, what is it? What is so? It, and he uses this. What's what's really interesting is he he kind of weaves uh, this language in throughout the what the rest of his rebuke here. Um, but this is what what starts it and um, what what sets the, the the context for what he's about to say in the in the next couple of sentences. Yes, here, but because worthy of repentance, repentance means that you need to Mm-hmm. So, showing your sinfulness, right? so uh, yeah, you're, you're on the right track there. So the worthy is, uh, it's not understood, and that's why that's why it translates keeping with uh, in this way. But the worthy is not to make one repentant, but that the fruits that you show are of that repentance that's there. So, yes. So you're uh, correct. In a, in, a, in a, yeah, in, in, in a different way. This is, um, keeping the life that looks like this. And so, you know, that shows forth your repentance. Um, and that's, and that is, the, that's what the fruit part is. And this is uh, another kind of just uh, motif that is in all the Gospels, really. Uh, but, uh, and, and, and throughout the rest of the New Testament. Uh, well, I actually, you just say the whole scripture. So might as well just say that. It's a motif throughout the whole scripture that fruit, something that, it, that brings forth fruit, uh, produces something, something that is how you recognize other things, this is what John is calling. He's saying, bear fruit in accordance with, keeping with, worthy of, that shows the worth of repentance. Um, and that is still the charge for us today. But what does that look like in our own lives? Okay. Give me, give me, give me an example that's like, what would be the one thing that would demonstrate this most significantly, I guess. Yes, that's it. That's it. Coming forth, saying, this is what I need. This is this is coming to God saying, Let's remember, repentance, this word, metanoia in the Greek, it literally means change your mind. Well, or, well, change a change of mind. 
a recognition, uh, and as, as I heard another um, pastor describe it, and it's closely related to the Hebrew. In fact, in the Hebrew, it's the it's the the same word, shuv, to return, to repent. So, bearing fruit worthy of repentance is exactly that: returning to the Lord your God, changing your mind. And that's not necessarily like okay. I mean, it is to an extent. I thought this way, and now I'm thinking this way. But that repentance, because it is born as fruit, is born by the Word. Hearing the Word. Letting it have its way with you. That bringing forth that in your life. So that you do demonstrate what is most important to you, which is at the rail. Receiving the absolution. Hearing the Word. Studying, growing in the Word. And living godly lives, as Luther says in the small catechism, according to the Word. So... That's really this call that John puts out to the Pharisees and the Sadducees because they are not doing that. They are instead uh, primarily, and this is how they're pictured, this is how they're uh, shown in the Gospel of Matthew, concerned with their own self-righteousness and with their appearance of righteousness. What John is saying, this is beyond just your, your externals. This is your heart, your mind, who you are. And that's what, that's what he's proclaiming to them. And so and he, he, his next sentence with that, verse 9, is the direct stab right at it. Do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For, he, for I tell you, God is even from these stones able to raise up children for Abraham. Okay, so in other words, they're, they're, uh, it, is being a, it, it is resting on their laurels in a sense. Um, saying, well, this is, this is who we are, so we don't have to do anything. Co correct, which which it was, but they were not keeping in step with that. Instead, they were making up their own stuff to do. They were, uh, you know, at worse as Jesus calls them out later, putting burdens on the people that they themselves could not keep, and that the people were, uh, you know, drowning under literally. So that's what John is saying here: is do not presume that because of your historic lineage that that these promises are yours. It's a life of repentance, returning to God, hearing his word, and especially in this time as they're being prepared for the Messiah to come, to be ready for that. Uh, so that's what uh, this is for, for them in that context, but even for us today. It's not to presume just because, uh, you know, we've talked about this in the elders' meetings. You know, what does it mean to be a good a member in good standing? Well, I mean, there's really a question of, have they shown that this is who they are? Uh, you know, and the, and, the, and the warning is not to just presume, well, I was baptized, I was confirmed, but I haven't been to church in however long, that all of a sudden, yeah, the, the, the promises of God, that you, you still have them. That's, a, that's arrogance on our part. Also pointing out to that you don't have to be necessarily in the lineage of Abraham. Correct. Yourself, Correct. You have nothing to do yeah. with Abraham. Correct. Exactly. Uh, yeah, which is a remarkable statements that yeah God will God will have his people even if they're stones um, and what's 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 even more kind of um, a, uh, a, a, a this is this is pushing it a little far but what is the what is the what is the first thing to announce the resurrection first thing that announces the resurrection Nope, before that. Did, did we just read some of that? So there, there's a tie in here. That, that's, so think about this verse. Uh, from, God is able from these stones to raise up children of Abraham. And the stone was rolled away. That's the first sign of the resurrection. Exactly, exactly. So there's a, there's a, a, a kind of a, like I said, it's pushing it a little bit, but there's this kind of dramatic irony that the stones... Because if he made children of Abraham out of the stones, they would praise God. The st st stone, yeah, well, yeah, but the stone rolls away. That's what the, the sign. The earth shake. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, um, that this, that the, well, yeah, and, and, and even in the Psalms, um, the earth will, uh, the earth shouts for joy. The, the seas clap their hands, you know, all of that. So, yeah, there's, there, there's just an interesting kind of irony here that it's, you know, the praise that is due God 
God's creation will praise him. Yeah, and, and, and don't presume that because of your past that, that you belong to that. Bear fruit, keeping with repentance. And then he goes into the, the, the uh, really the part of the judgment of the, I mean, all of this is rebuke, rebuke and judgment. Even now the ax is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Okay, so he's pulling in the fruit metaphor again. Um, this is, uh, oh, and one more comment on the, uh, with the, well, it's, it, it's related to this. This is all part of the great reversal that is a theme that's in Matthew. Pharisees and the Sadducees were the ones that were presumed to be righteous, the ones who were presumed to be the holiest people that are closest to God. But here is John saying, you guys aren't that. So it's this great reversal that's happening. But even now the axe is laid to the root of the tree. So that means that judgment is prepared right now. Every tree that therefore does not bear good fruit, that does not bear fruit worthy of repentance in keeping with repentance, uh, is cut down and thrown into the fire. So that's that, that should really scare us, scare the hell out of us because it's fire. Um, and that's, that's the judgment that will come. So, and he's saying that the one who's going to bring that in the, in the next sentence, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand and he will clear his threshing floor and gather the wheat to the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So you see these two metaphors running, the fruits in the trees and then the judgment of fire against those who are cast out, who are not, uh, who are not brought in, who are not part of um, the kingdom. The, uh, Jesus will pick this up later and say, say you will know a tree by its fruit, um, and a good tree produces good fruit, bad trees produce bad fruit. He's particularly talking about pastors at that point, or leaders in the church, uh, but it's, it's drawing on this same, same idea. Um, when John talks about baptism, so he says, I baptize you with water for repentance. It is the same returning, changing of your mind, recognition. But with John's baptism, with John's baptism, it is a baptism of preparation. Versus Jesus' baptism, which he will, which will, which John mentions here, is a baptism of fulfillment. So, baptism of, re, of preparation. This is for this is for repentance. And as it says in the, in the previous verses, there is the forgiveness of sins conveyed with it, but it is incomplete because what is the one thing that that John and he himself says this that his baptism does not give that Jesus' baptism does give. Well, that, that's still that's still kind of in that Holy Spirit. Okay. That is the biggest difference between the two. And by the Holy Spirit being given, by the baptism of fulfillment being given, because when, we, when it's expounded upon later, um, one, it's baptism in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, so the Triune God. Uh, two, it is a baptism into what Christ Himself has done. And so, while this is in preparation, it does not deliver, ultimately, salvation. When Christ rises from the dead, and then in, 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 in the Gospel of Matthew, this is how the Gospel ends, he says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. That's the completion of everything that's being set up. So that's what distinguishes Jesus' baptism from John's. Okay. The forgiveness of sins does come in Jesus' baptism. That's part of the salvation. And the Holy Spirit who comes in Jesus' baptism. Also, as he says, I will or he will baptize, John says, Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. 
there's a purification that happens with that as well. That's where, where that imagery comes from. So both, um, so also another interesting contrast, water and fire, um, because how is Jesus' baptism still instituted? With water, but it's that it does what both water washing away, fire purifying there. Okay. Um, this is always a, a question that comes up and it, it's always a, a debate because there are, uh, people will say, well, Jesus was Jesus came out to John's baptism when he was 30 and uh, you know that that's, that's the formula for baptism. It's like, no, Jesus institutes something different when he rises from the dead. Um, and also gets to, because when we talk about, when the Bible talks about baptism, not just us, when the Bible talks about baptism, it says that there's a necessary component to that for salvation. Uh, Jesus says, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. Uh, 1 Peter 3, Baptism now saves you. So there's there's a distinction between those two, and then that gift is given to, uh, you know, uh, th that is what Jesus says, this is how you make disciples, Matthew 28. Um, so that's that's a, a distinction between the two. Questions on that? Correct. This, yeah. Correct. Yeah, and right, yeah, 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 and 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 that's really what John's baptism was right. was this incomplete washing. While it was, it, I mean, it was sacramental. It was um, forgiveness of sins. It was for repentance to return to God, um, to prepare for the arrival of the Messiah. It was not the fullness of baptism that Jesus institutes later, and we see that also uh, foreshadowed in Jesus' own baptism. Which comes a little, which comes right after this. Uh, but in terms of the, the context here, so John is preaching this fiery uh, message, and it is, you know, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. You guys who presume to belong to the kingdom of God, I'm telling you that a God can make uh, children of Abraham out of the stones, bear fruit, keeping with repentance. You know, he's blasting all these things. For one is coming who is mightier than I, who is going to judge with fire, who is going to uh, the the judgment is ready, the axe is laid at the root of the tree. So, and this last verse, his winnowing fork is in his hand. So he's talking about the one who is coming. He will clear the threshing floor, gather the wheat to the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. That is uh, the judgment day. That is everything that Jesus has come to do. His, he will gather, the rest he will burn. So it's this, uh, you know, this overwhelming um, hellfire and brimstone preaching um, from John. And it is this, you know, it is, there's a, a sense of fear that he, he's trying to evoke to, to get repentance. Why I bring all that up is because that is meant, again, this is the great reversal theme that's going on. When Jesus comes out to be baptized by John, it's completely not what John expects. So uh, if you guys, one of you will read verses 13 through 17 of Matthew chapter 3. Then Jesus came from Galilee to Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and he, you come to me. But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, because it is ready for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized immediately, he went out from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Okay. So this is, uh, again, with what John is saying, with those who are com coming out to be baptized by him for repentance, preparation for Messiah, when the Messiah actually shows up, when Jesus comes down to him, John hesitates. Because for him, this doesn't make any sense. God's supposed to come and judge and destroy and you know, make things right, which he will. But it's just not in the time that John is thinking will happen. This comes up later, Matthew chapter 10, um, with, with John, still so kind of struggling with that idea. But, um, so Jesus comes out to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, would have uh, stopped him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? So John recognizes the authority there. He recognizes who Jesus is, and that, that he is the one who brings the Holy Spirit, baptizes with fire, who is, is coming to uh, be the deliverer, the Messiah of the people. And so he's he's recognizing that, but Jesus tells him, let it be so for now, be so now, for thus it is fitting to fulfill all righteousness. In other words, what Jesus is, the, in, in the imagery that is drawn from this, uh, we actually have this in our baptismal prayer, is that Jesus is 
kind of pulling back the curtain a little of saying, here's what I've come to do. I've not come, and this is the language from the Gospel of John, I've not come into the world to condemn the world, but to save it through me. And the way that I'm going to save it, the way that I'm going to fulfill all righteousness for all people is by being one with them. So when Jesus comes down to be baptized by John, this is him uh, casting his lot with sinners. All those who have come out to John that are there to receive his baptism, they said they're confessing their sins. And so this is, uh, the sinners need this baptism. Jesus, the sinless one, doesn't need it. That's why John hesitates. But in doing it, he is saying, I am, am, am here for these people, for sinners, in this great reversal. He doesn't come in this moment as the judge. He comes instead as as, 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 the, as, the, yeah, as the sinner, as the servant. Right, right. The servant. Um, and he has said to stand with the sinners. Correct. And, and stand in for the sinners. Um, these are uh, the, the other things that, that, that are going on here um, with, with the imagery that's, that's here relates also back to the suffering servant from Isaiah, uh, from different uh, chapters in Isaiah, talking about my servant on whom I will put my spirit, um, whom I, whom I uh, behold, whom I am well pleased, all those things. Um, this is God confirming that with his voice from heaven. This is my beloved son. So, um, at, at God's, or at Jesus' baptism, this is another important thing, um, that you have all three member persons of the Trinity present. And so, you talk to Jehovah's Witnesses, this is something you could bring up to them. Um, or it's, yeah. So, you have God the Father in heaven, speaking forth his word, and this is a terrible drawing, the Holy Spirit descending, uh, I don't know how to make this like Jesus, but whatever, uh, normally I draw him on a cross, so put his arms out like he's on a cross, uh, Jesus there, so we have all three members of the Trinity here and present at the baptism. Why this is significant is because this is a foreshadow of last verse in Matthew. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Okay. All three are present. Jesus' baptism, all three are present. When Jesus speaks the words of what we are to be baptized into, how disciples are made. Um, the other thing that this reveals, this is the public, okay, the, yeah, this is the public anointing of Jesus with the Holy Spirit. So anointing, important word, because that is what kings and priests in the Old Testament, they were anointed. That's how they were shown to be king and priest. That's uh, the importance of the, the dove actually descending upon him. The second thing is, as Matthew has recorded earlier, when he was uh, up with the birth narrative, when the angel reveals to Joseph, he will be conceived by what is conceived in Mary is from the Holy Spirit. So Jesus already always always has the Holy Spirit, but here is the public demonstration of that so that it is made manifest, made visible for those around them, that they would come to believe this is the anointed one. Or the Hebrew word for that, or the Greek word, Christ. In fact, is this also... It also shows us that you know, still before God is uh, one hundred percent man and one hundred percent God. Okay. And Jesus is, yeah. Yeah, Jesus is. And so at that baptism of God, it's showing that he is one hundred percent man. Yes. But yet we see that he's you know, God. So that he's God. He's yes. Not God, but, he is God. but it, yeah, it's it's that public announcement uh, that he is also exactly. Um, and then, which we'll see in chapter four, it's the testing of that. But um, so you're absolutely right. And this is, uh, and, and that's uh, hugely significant that, it, that he is fully man, fully God, always at the same time together. Because the other, the other thing, and this goes with the, uh, 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 the baptismal prayer and kind of Jesus casting himself with, with sinners. Luther, and, and I, I like this imagery. I mean, I'm not sure that you can actually just like 100% prove that it's true. Uh, but I, I do believe that, that the illustration is, is very good. So when the people were coming out to the Jordan River and they are confessing their sin, they're speaking forth their sin, they're receiving a washing from John 
into back into the Jordan River. So in a sense, the people's sins have been washed into the river. But now the sinless one comes and stands in there as God and man, particularly as God who created everything. He, as he is washed in this uh, river, takes the sins upon himself, like literally. And the way the, the, way the prayer in, um, in the, the baptismal, surface, sur, baptismal rite is, um, by his washing in the Jordan, he sanctified all waters. So this is you know, God in the midst of his creation cleansing all waters. It's like I said, I, I don't know that you could just see that. Yeah, right. Correct, correct. And and this is also so as the anointed one, and this is you, we, for for Matthew's audience, they've already they already know the story. Jesus died and he rose again. So it's like he's kind of teaching them what all the greater significance of these things. When reading this and understanding this or hearing this, um, we see that this where he takes on the sins of everyone here. And where does he take those sins? Yes, that's it. It's eventually to the cross. And that is where he shows himself most fully as the anointed one. See, that's much easier to draw. And so he bears, he becomes the, uh, the, the word, I, I think, I, I definitely know one of my, a professor has used this, and I think Luther uses this. But this is where he becomes the sin bearer for all people. And for all who would be incorporated into him, that's what he does. Uh, okay. This is uh, the Spirit of God of sins. Uh, the a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Um, there's one other time that this is said. And it comes right before Jesus sets his face to Jerusalem to go to the cross. Exactly. The transfiguration, okay? which is a tie-in, again, back to this. Because who's the one that is doing this baptism? Who did, who did Jesus come out to be baptized by? John. What does John stand in for? Exactly. So he is the basically the whole Old Testament in, 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 in one person. He is the prophet, or, or he's the one of whom the prophets foretold, uh, the voice crying in the wilderness. Jesus will say later, he is the Elijah who precedes the Lord. So there's this, this other connection of when uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all together and, and are proclaimed in that way, um, that it's a completion of the Old Testament. So Moses and Elijah on the transfiguration, showing that Jesus is the one who is to come to fulfill it. Same at the baptism. Right. All right. This all leads to, and this in particular, uh, the, uh, the something to understand that chapters were not in the original text, so they break them up uh, based on where they thought it would be good. But I, I, I think this is actually a really good ending for chapter 3 because this sets up, uh, you, you've learned who Jesus is. He is, by the actions, the anointed one. By the words of the Father, he is the beloved Son of God. And by other things that are going on, he is the one who has come to be the suffering servant, the sin bearer for us. Then chapter 4 jumps into, okay, if you are that, show me. Who's the one who comes to challenge Jesus on that? Satan in the wilderness. Right. So. Questions on, on, on this? So this continues to build Matthew's narrative of who this Jesus is. The, the, uh, he's proclaimed to be the beloved son of God, all of this here. Now we get to start to see this go, uh, how does this play out? How does, in a real sense, how does Jesus uh, assume this identity and carry it out uh, in the world? And that first is the testing of that by Satan in the wilderness. So he's let out into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Okay, so John is out baptizing in the wilderness, so there's assume it's just not very far from where John is. But again, uh, the key there is the wilderness. What happened in the wilderness in the past? Was that... Okay, so it's a, it's a, so, 
Correct. Yeah. Correct. Israel, after they come out of Egypt, uh, they wander in the wilderness for how long? 40 years. Okay. What is that, what is that time for them? Why does, why does God do that? Yes. So it's a, it's a punishment from them, and it's a time of testing. Are they going to rely on God or not? Um, the uh, Actually, was it? Maybe it was a reading it did for uh, the circuit meeting. Yeah, yeah, it had to have been for the circuit meeting. But there's, um, or no, no, no. They quarreled with they quarreled with Moses about the rock, and Moses strikes the rock. And that's that's Exodus, but um, it's that type of it's that type of thinking that still pervades all the people of Israel. Eventually, you know, they 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 construct the golden calf. That's the problem, and that's why you know God makes them go into the wilderness for those forty years to get rid of those who were corrupting, and also to, to test them um, as well. Will they be faithful? The answer is no, they're not. <laughs> so. But God is merciful and gracious to them and still keeps his promises to them. That's the significance here. Jesus goes out to the wilderness for how many days? 40 days, 40 nights. Okay? He's out there and he's hungry. He's fasting during this time. And so the, the 40 days represents 40, 40 years in the wilderness, um, 40 days of the flood, 40 days of um, uh, Moses being up on the mountain, uh, 40 days. There's another one. I can't remember it now. But all those things, this concept of 40 plays into to this. And Jesus is there to be tested as the Son of God. Remember from earlier in, in uh, Matthew with the, with the flight to Egypt, Matthew says, out of or he's quoting um, the prophet uh, Micah or Malachi, I can't remember which one. But he's quoting the prophet and he says, out of Egypt I have called my son. So that was in reference to Israel, the Old Testament, Exodus. But that son failed when it went to the wilderness. Here is the beloved son of God who's going in the wilderness. The question is, will he fail or will he remain faithful? So the tempter comes. First, and the the, the thing that Satan says, uh, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Okay. So the question that Satan is putting to Jesus is not, are you hungry? It, it is, yes, it is, and, and not are you God, how are you going to use your godly powers? Because that's really, and that's what Satan is trying to uh, tempt Jesus away from. And this is, going back to the fully man, fully God part, this this is a real temptation for Jesus. I mean, he is he has experienced hunger, that's what he says. Um, and so this is a, 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 a sincere test of, will he remain faithful or not? Now, the answer is yes, he will, uh, but it's in this place that he actually shows it. On divine service, in the confession and absolution, we say, uh, most merciful God, we confess that we are, by nature, sinful and unclean. Is that actually correct? I'd say yes. Okay, so in, in that regard, yes. But is human nature actually sinful? What's that? I just said, wow. But, um, I would yes. So for us, yes. Because, oh, so, okay, right. so we'll back up to creation. Correct. 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 So, so, so well, by nature, we're not. But by sin, we are. Correct. And the, the nature that we have inherited from Adam, from those conceived by the natural way, going back to Wednesday. Um, yeah. What's that? Except for one. Exactly. And that's that's the thing. That's what sets Jesus apart. Is he is not conceived in the natural way. He's conceived by the Holy Spirit. So he is still fully human. He's actually even more human than we are. Because exactly. Exactly. So human nature was not made with sin. Otherwise, Jesus would be sin. But Adam and Eve were not made with sin. It's only after they disobey God that that sinful nature corrupts mankind and corrupts every man, man woman, and child from that point on. All those conceived in the natural way. But Jesus, by his conception in the Holy Spirit, which we'll actually celebrate next Saturday, by the way. Anybody know what next Saturday is? 
What's that? The Annunciation. March 25th. Nine months before December 25th. So, um, but, so Jesus is, in a real sense, more human than everyone else. He is actually what what we were supposed to, to what was supposed to be intended in the beginning. Why that's also important is when Jesus promises to raise us from the dead, then we'll actually be fully human the way we were intended to be without sin. So, um, I I bring all that up because as he goes out, these are real temptations, but Jesus is not, he does not have that sinful flesh in him that is weak and that gives into. In fact, he proves this is it, but that, uh, that's also what Satan is going after is not necessarily the appetites, you're hungry, but how are you going to be God's son for these people? That's really what Satan is going after. So the first temptation is use your power for your benefit. Turn stones into bread. I know you can do it. Show it. Use your power the wrong way. Jesus says, it is written, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So Jesus says, no, I'm not going to play your game. I'm going to listen to, really, my word, my Father's word, our word, together. You don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Every word that has said to this beloved son, as we just heard in the, the baptism right before this, and what he has come to be at, in, or, in order to fulfill all righteousness. So he is going to live by that word and not by the bread, not by misusing his power. Correct. To, 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 be, the, to be the sin bearer, to uh, be the anointed one for the sake of the world. Okay. Second temptation. Similar, similar concept again, but this this time the the, the Satan, the devil, um, challenges him for, against God's word. So the first one is kind of a, 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 it's it's not an overt corruption of God's word. The second one is definitely because Satan says, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written. He's on a high high place. He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. Does anyone know where that, where those verses come from? What's that? Yeah, we, we have a hymn that actually sings these words. I, 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 I loosely a hymn. It's in our hymn. I'm not a big fan of it. It's kind of, kind of sappy, but whatever. Some people like it, and that's fine. This is, this is, this is cited from Psalm 91, and the, the song is. Uh, yeah, uh, and he will bear you up on evil's wings. Right? Yeah. Make you to shine like the sun. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I just, one, I'm not a big fan of it musically. I guess that's kind of sappy. But then I always think, you know, Satan used these words to tempt Jesus. I always feel weird singing it. Or even even when we do it in the intro, because uh, it was the intro that yeah, that's that's what it's meant for. Uh, but there's also this. Well, Satan used that to. So anyway, um, but that's that's Satan's temptation here. He is actually using, misusing, of course, but tempting Jesus with the Word of God because these things are actually written. This is Psalm 91, um, and Psalm 91 is is beautiful. Uh, it is, it is a, a great psalm of uh, how the Lord defends us, but. You know, these things are actually written about Jesus, about the Messiah. So in, in, a, in a weird sense, uh, Satan has uh, understands how to read the Bible correctly. He knows it's all about Jesus, but he just doesn't believe. So anyways, so he, uh, so he uses those words against Jesus, but Jesus, who is the author of the Bible, is the word of God made flesh, um, so tells him, you're, you know, basically corrects his uh, misappropriation of God's word, saying, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. That doesn't mean these things are untrue about Jesus, but he's basically telling Satan, the word is to be used the way God wants it to be used, and the way ultimately I uh, tell it, say it is to be used, not according to your uh, misinterpretation or, or mis misapplication of it. If you think about that, that's, this parallels the temptation in the garden. That's why, actually, on um, 
first Sunday in Lent this year was Genesis 3, which is the fall, temptation in the fall of Adam and Eve. And then it's also was this text of uh, the temptation by Jesus, or, or by Satan of Jesus. That in Genesis chapter 3, the fall is because Adam and Eve listen and believe the misapplication of God's word, the, the corruption of God's word from Satan's mouth. That's what causes them to fall. This is the proof that Jesus resists that temptation and overcomes that and defeats the, the, the devil's ploy here. So that's the, the second temptation. The third temptation, again, it's kind of collecting all of this here. The devil takes him to the high mountain, shows him all the kingdoms of the world. All these I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. What the devil is doing here is trying to get Jesus, again, not to be the Son of God, not to listen to the Word of God, but to, uh, in doing it, not to be the one who suffers for the sake of the people. Uh, well, yes, because of this is what God has sent him forth to do, to be the beloved son, the suffering servant, the sin bearer, all of that. And he's trying to get him to do it by ease. If you fall down and worship me, which first that breaks the first commandment, I will give you all of these, the kingdoms of the Lord. Okay? Whereas Jesus is, is his mission, what he's come to do, is to win the kingdom of the kingdoms of the world by his own death. So it's it's this temptation to the easy way out of this. Okay? We need Jerry here to talk about the easy and the hard from Thursday. What's that? Yeah. Uh, but but that's what that's that's what Satan is going after here is Basically saying, you don't have to go to the cross for these people. You don't have to put up with these people. Um, I, you know, just just worship me and I'll give them to you. And Jesus says, no, be gone, Satan. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Which is, again, the, the rebuke, uh, uh, properly uh, uh, confessing and believing the first commandment. But second, Jesus is confessing what it is that he has come to do. He will be the Messiah. He will be the Christ. He will be the beloved Son of God who has come to save his people from their sins, as the angel said earlier. He will do that the way God has intended, that Christ should suffer and die on the third day rise. He will make that apparent as, as the ministry, as, as his teachings go on. So, um, there in the wilderness, Jesus, as the beloved Son of God, the faithful Son of God, triumphs over Satan, whereas everyone else in the past has failed. That's what sets Jesus apart. And this is um, where the importance of this comes out in that as Jesus goes to the cross, he has been perfectly obedient, actively, meaning doing the right thing, on behalf of all people. He's been actively obeying God's word, God's voice, his father's um, uh, what his father has said has said he is and sent him to do this entire time. The biggest example of that is his obedience to, to God his father against Satan. Uh, why that's important on the cross is because that's what he offers in place of all of our disobedience. So when he dies, he perfectly atones, pays for our disobedience, our sinfulness. Okay. What is, what is, is there a significance of just the three temptations versus just being continually badgered for 40 days and 40 nights? So, I say, I mean, yeah. it doesn't say that specifically, but who's to say it didn't actually happen? So, Mark, uh, in the Gospel of Mark, because the Gospel of Mark doesn't have any of the actual like temptations in it, it just says Jesus was out in the wilderness being tempted by the devil for 40 days and 40 nights. So, uh, you get the impression that it is there, that it is 40 days and 40 nights of this badgering. The way Luke and Matthew present it is um, this is the culmination of that are these three temptations. So, um, but yeah, it is. I, I, uh, I'm I'm pretty certain it was the badgering for forty days and forty nights. Because he wouldn't he wouldn't be living as us if it wasn't. Yeah, <laughs> you know, right. So. And 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 if you and if you think about to turn these stones into bread, that's that seems like that would be a, a Matthew condenses it into one episode, but that seems like that would be something that would be nagging over the 40 days, 